You know, when it comes to the Word of God, diets do not apply. Intermittent fasting does not work with our spiritual life. And if you come here on a Sunday morning and th that's the only feed that you're getting, well, that's a pretty significant intermittent fast. And so I put out the challenge last week uh, that uh, as we journey through the book of Acts, we want to be spending time as the church, you want to be spending time yourself reading, preparing. And uh, we have those journals, as opportunities way for ways to be able to engage. I'll probably spent the majority of my life working with young people to try and, uh, and work with them in ways to engage with the word of God. And so often I think it's seen as uh, inaccessible. There's something that maybe is intimidating about that, but you know, that's not the intention of the word of God. And uh, just a couple of things to think about as we, uh, bef before I get into Acts chapter one, uh, why regularly study God's word? both personally and corporately. And I've got a few things should be going up on the screen up there. First of all, Bible study is essential to growth. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Just as we're feeding our little grandson and those sort of things, we have the anticipation that he'll grow up. He's moved from milk, he's onto solids now, and so it is with the word of God. We, it is essential to our growth as believers. Secondly, Bible study is essential to spiritual maturity. Hebrews 5, 11 to 14, but verse 14 says, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to be able to distinguish good from evil. And it's part of the process towards our spiritual maturity. And thirdly, Bible study is essential for spiritual effectiveness. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why we do it. That's why we do it as a church. That's why we uh, should be doing it personally so that we grow, we mature, and we are effective as Christians. But part of that engagement was particularly showing young people how to access the word of God. And I realise in a group like this, it's a very diverse group where some of you have been on the road, Christian road for many, many years and you're well and truly students of the word. But others of you, maybe it does feel a bit intimidating and, uh, and even knowing where to start. And I've just got three things up there on the screen that is a process that we'll be working through. And I'll work it through with you this morning as we work our way through Acts 1. And when it comes to reading God's word, there are three aspects to it. Observation, uh, what do I see? That's the what question. And we're looking at things where um, Jason already pointed out, looking at that word suffering and how much was sitting behind that single word. So there's, there's an observation there. Why? Because Luke is writing to his friend, he's writing to um, the Gentile church and so on. We, we need to observe what it was that he was saying. The next part then is interpretation. What does it mean? The why? We're asking questions about the text and what we're looking at. And uh, we're looking at answers. We're trying to connect it together and make sense of it. And finally, there is the application. What does it mean to me? That's the how part of it. And we can't get to that part of it until uh, we, we carry out the observation and interpretation. So as you went through Acts 1 this week, I trust there was some observation looking at key words, looking at what was happening in Acts chapter 1 and the movement and the things that were unfolding there. In your newsletter last week, and I gave you again this week, and the handout there was an observation matrix and uh, that should be up on the screen there. How did you go with that? And I just gave some key themes that we should be seeing coming out of the book of Acts. And uh, I've just gone through and just put a few verses in there where I felt some of these themes were being addressed from this chapter itself. So uh, that's a tool. It's just there as a tool to be able to help you uh, as you work your way through. Okay, I'm going to use a similar sort of format that I did at the commissioning service at the end of January. We're going to have the text up on the screen up there and I'm just going to work my way through and uh, point out some of the observations, uh, some of the interpretation that sits there 
and, uh, and obviously some of the applications, some things that we can take away there. Okay, let me just, uh, we're just going to test that you're getting that orange line up there. Not coming up black, but anyway, that's okay. Let's, let's work our, our way through Acts chapter 1. There's a fair bit to cover and uh, there's not a lot of time to go in a lot of detail through it, but let's work it through. In my former book, we talked about this last week as we looked at the author of Acts, and this is, the, this is Luke speaking, who wrote the Gospel. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, and uh, it's a two-volume, uh, two-part two volume, and uh, I likened it to being season one and season two. Well, today we're starting on season one, uh, season two, episode one. He's writing uh, to his friend uh, Theophilus. Theophilus uh, was a Greek, and but probably uh, more significant in the context here, uh, coming out of the Jewish setting, is that he was a Gentile. And, and uh, Luke says then, and I wrote in his former book about all the things that Jesus began to do and to, and to teach. And I think a good way of summing up Acts then is that it's actually, it's a continuation of what was happening that Luke had done in that previous volume. And now what Jesus is continuing to do by his spirit and uh, through the church. So the book of Acts is actually, is the continuing story uh, that uh, Luke is unfolding before us. Verse two, there until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen until. So there's this, we're, this, we're in this intervening period that uh, uh, Jason has already referred to there and, uh, and he gave instructions to the apostles. In fact, Luke 24, 44 says, he says to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And then it says that Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Not only had he done that with those uh, disciples who were on the road to Emmaus, but he's doing it with his disciples as a group here. And I can't help but think that in this 40-day period that Jesus is helping connect the dots so that these guys would have a clearer understanding of what was said and done in the Old Testament, how it relates to Jesus, and then how that was going to look uh, in the future. And I think that, that uh, there's an important comment that we'll see there, um, that we'll see there that'll come out uh, a little further down the track. So he's giving the instructions there, and I think we, uh, that can certainly be referred to uh, Luke 24, uh, 44 there when he opened up their minds so they could understand the scriptures. After his suffering, verse 3 there, he presented himself to them and he gave many convincing proofs, many convincing proofs in that time period uh, following his death that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Jesus spent those last 40 days a significant 40 days. And I think uh, one aspect that he was doing there was, the, was consoling the disciples, um, restoring Peter. We have to remember that leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, these are the disciples that had denied and had abandoned him. We are only talking about a very brief period of time. And, uh, and yet in this, in this 40 days, uh, since Jesus' resurrection there, here he is coming alongside them. And I think, you know, there was a, there was a consoling aspect there as he worked through with them. The, 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 not only their denial and their abandonment of him, uh, but to also to see him suffer in the way that he did. Uh, secondly, it says there the many convincing proofs that he was alive and I think he was bringing to them, proving to them the, the auth auth authenticity of his resurrection. This is, this is going to be fundamental to the rest of uh, the book of Acts. It's going to be fundamental to the sermons that are going to come out of the book of Acts there, the authenticity of his resurrection. I think Luke, in writing to this Gentile, uh, is, is highlighting this point and uh, we'll see that come out. And uh, finally, the last part there, he spoke to them again, as, as, as Jason has referred to as well, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. 
in a sense, I guess, deconstructing their false understandings of the kingdom of God and trying to set them uh, on a right course. We see the disciples now set up, they're set up with the truth in this time period that Jesus spent with them. But at this stage, they didn't have the power uh, behind that truth. It's about to actually come in the next chapter. It's about to come in verse 8 with the, the promise of what was coming. But to a world that was dominated by evil and the challenges that they were going to be faced before them, they were going to need... Uh, that not only the truth established in their life, but the power to be able to take that truth out. And uh, we're now just in this, in this little window of time prior to that um, power coming. Verse, uh, verses four and five, on one occasion while he was eating with them, so you, you actually see there's, a, there's a, almost a, a time shift there. There's a um, there's, there's a gap as it were and he just comes back and he says on one occasion while he was eating with them he gave them this command he said do not leave Jerusalem but wait wait for the gift that my father promised which you've heard me speak about for John baptized with water but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit Jesus was telling him there's a special event that was happening he'd spoken about it previously and, uh, and it would be happening uh, soon, but there's that instruction there that's sitting there uh, that says wait. I don't know if you've been in that place. I'm sure we all have been in that place there, in terms of waiting, waiting on the Lord, waiting to see what God is doing. And do you know what? In those times of waiting, we see it actually here with the disciples themselves. God, God, God's plan as it unfolds in our lives. God's plan is honoured when we respond in two ways, uh, in trust and obedience. That's the call on us as Christians to trust God. So he says to them, wait. And he's, but he had said to them, don't leave Jerusalem, wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And there's a number of references there that we can... Uh, that you can head back to, uh, Luke 3, 16 is one of them, where John said that Jesus would, would actually baptise with the Holy Spirit and fire. John would baptise with water, but Jesus would come and baptise with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so in the early chapters of Luke there, volume one as it were, there's already an indication of what's going to be happening. Uh, Luke chapter... Uh, 11 verse uh, 13, Jesus speaking of the good gifts that a father gives his children. He says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who uh, ask him? And then finally in Luke uh, 12 verses 11 to 12, Jesus warned the disciples of the future. Back here in the middle of Luke, he warns them, but he promised them, when you are brought before synagogues, Rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. And these things would be coming back to their recollection. And Jesus is probably, again, helping connect some of those uh, sort of dots there. And uh, Luke refers to that there in Luke, uh, in, uh, in these verses here. Verse 6, then they gathered round him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And I th we've got to understand that the disciples here, they're going to, undergoing this really significant paradigm shift. This paradigm shift uh, in terms of how they were brought up and what they were taught. And this is a major part of it this kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of God. And I think they were struggling to understand Jesus' agenda in this. They'd been taught all their lives that the kingdom of God was Israel. They'd been taught all their lives to expect a Messiah who would come back and revive and restore their nation. They'd been taught all their lives to expect a religious and political leader who would wear the king's crown and a high priest's robe. That was sitting out there on their horizon, deeply embedded in their culture and their training and their backgrounds. I mentioned to you when uh, looking at Israel's place in the future, that one day in the future, Jesus will wear that kingly crown and that priestly robe uh, for Israel. But that sits out there 
and still in the future in regards to the nation of Israel. And I think it's interesting when you, you look at the, the, um, the, the connection between verse 6 and verse 7 there. Jesus was certainly about the building of the kingdom of God, but it was going to be on his father's timing and his father's condition. Verse 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times. He didn't correct them in terms of what they were going there. He, he's, he's re-diverted them. He says, not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. There's almost a sense you can hear Jesus saying, guys, relax on that one, that one. God's got it and it's going to be on his schedule, which comes straight then into verse 8, uh, which joins straight onto it. Uh, and I'm going to have to refer you back, if you want a bit more detail on this verse, back to that last Sunday in January when I did the teacher's commissioning service and I spent uh, the service on verse 8 here. But I'm just going to refer to parts of it. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And here we see promise number one. The, t- the, theme that I, the title that I had was Two Promises, Two Prayers and a Position Vacant. So there's, there's promise number one. But you will receive power. They haven't received it yet. Will there? It's speaking into the future. You will receive that power. That power there is, is the ability. It's not a strength power. It's an ability. And it's going to happen when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's going to be external. It's not something you're going to manufacture inside yourself. And, uh, but with that Holy Spirit, with that ability that you have, you will then be my witnesses uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And, uh, and it's already uh, been referred to there that we have uh, th- there in this verse a bit of an outline, a geographical outline as to how the gospel is going to expand from Jerusalem out through Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In the Old Testament, God filled and empowered certain individuals for a brief time and a specific purpose with the Holy Spirit. This announcement that the Spirit of God would indwell the disciples and ultimately every believer was a, such a significant mind shift. It's incredible when you think about it. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Joel had all indicated that a new kind of kingdom would emerge from this new covenant And in this new kingdom, God's people would be given the power to be able to live out God's purposes by him dwelling in him. That's that significant shift. We now, with the presence of the Holy Spirit, have the power to be able to live out the life uh, that God has called us to. And that power would be given to uh, the disciples, as I've already referred to, as an ability so that they would be his witnesses, so that we are to be his witnesses. Matthew 28 says, go and make disciples. Acts 1.8 says, the power will be, able, will be given to you to be able to empower you to be able to go. And there we have that, uh, I think, a, a concise summary of Acts there uh, in terms of the geographical spread of the gospel. These are, in fact, the last words of Jesus. I'll draw a line across there. The last words. How significant in terms of his last words, and it was this promise that was going to be given, and the coming of the Holy Spirit that was really going to redefine what the kingdom of God looked like and how that was going to be worked out in his people's lives. It's interesting, the disciples were interested in God's program for Israel because in verse 7 there, in verse 6 there, they want to know, Lord, when, uh, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And they're trying to work out the timing and the significance of this. Verse 8 though, as I said, Jesus diverted their question to the coming of the Holy Spirit and the power that would be imparted to them. And I think there's a, there's a good place there to be able to, uh, to highlight what I think is one of the principles uh, that principles, <sighs> we can get the spelling right. Let's just get the eraser and do that. Let's start it again. Principle number one. The church is not built on programs, but God's power through the Holy Spirit. 
The disciples were interested in God's program and what it was going to look like for Israel. But Jesus pointed them to the Holy Spirit. And I think there's a principle for us as a church as well. And whilst we might have lots of activity and so on that's happening here, the church itself is not built on programs, but it's the Holy Spirit working in our lives and through this church here that God's, uh, God's church will, uh, uh, will be effective. Let's keep going. Verse 9. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes and he was, uh, and a cloud hid them from their sight. Taken up. He was taken up before their very eyes. It's actually Luke who records both ascensions in both the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And, it, and it's interesting, and, and I think, and I appreciate Jason bringing this to communion as well, because I think we often focus on the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it wasn't the finishing point of Christ's journey. In fact, in the early church, the ascension was an integral part of the movement of, of Jesus in this last period of time. There was his there was his death, there was his burial, there's his resurrection, and there's his ascension. They weren't disconnected. And his ascension is important for three, for three reasons. First of all, it demonstrates his lordship. He is lord. He is lord over all in terms of the kingdom of God. He now reigns from heaven in his rightful place. He has now become the mediator uh, of those who believe in him, interceding for the church. And you can read a bit about that in Hebrews 4 and 5. And he also actively participates in judgment uh, seated at the right hand of his father. The ascension, the ascension is, an, is an integral part of, of the movement of, uh, of Jesus' death, resurrection, his ascension, because it now puts him in that exalted place. It's just one continuous flow through there. And we'll actually you'll see the significance of this in the next chapter when we get to Acts chapter 2. Peter will then connect some of those dots. Okay, promise number two. They were looking intently up into the sky. Here's he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking in the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way as you've seen him and depart. Promise number two, Jesus will come back. And I think there's another significant theological theme here in Acts. While Jesus came, we see in the book of Luke as a humble baby, we see him in Acts here. Uh, the reference is his second coming when he does return will be as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we will, event, we will see that fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 uh, finally fulfilled in Jesus' second coming. And it's significant that the disciples reminded, the, dis, uh, the angels reminded the disciple of Christ's second coming attached to his ascension. Where those that Jesus uh, spoke of in his prayer in John 17, we believe having not seen him. And it's the same faith that's required in terms of having not seen him and we believe, but we also by faith in terms of his return. What does it look like when we live in that space knowing that Jesus is coming back? It should affect how we live. Uh, then verse 12, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk uh, from the city. And uh, that was about a kilometre or so. They had regulations that sit around, sat around what they could and couldn't do on the Sabbath they returned to Jerusalem because, in fact, you may remember in verse 4, they were told to wait in Jerusalem. And when they, uh, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying and the, those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James, not the Judas, uh, the betrayer. So there we have uh, the, the, the disciples in a place of obedience and, uh, and they obeyed and they returned to Jerusalem where they would wait. Verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer. They all joined together constantly in prayer. And uh, that one's uh, worth uh, underlining there. They were 
is constantly in prayer. They all prayed. They all joined together. In some versions it says they're all in one accord. This expression is actually used in a number of other chapters. Chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 15. What a contrast to the 40 days prior in the garden. Matthew 26, 56 says, But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and they fled. What a contrast that is taken. And the resurrection sits at the center of that, of that space there. And here they are, joined together, constantly in prayer. And Luke then includes this little comment here, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. I put in the discussion questions for something to either think about in your home group or personally or whatever this week, uh, to, to make the connect back to Mark 3 and John 7 in terms of the movement of Jesus' family. That, that was significant. It was significant they were there. Why, why were they? They were there not uh, just as Jesus' family, they were there as believers. Mary there as well, not in any sort of prominent place, not in any position uh, deserving of her being the, the mother of Jesus, but as a believer, there she is. And uh, just an interesting little comment that Luke includes here at the end of verse 14. Okay, let's draw another period of time across there. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, brothers and sisters, the scriptures had to be filled the scriptures had to be fulfilled uh, in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and he shared in our difference. Uh, shared, I'm reading between two spaces. And he shared in our ministry. So here we have Peter taking the lead. We see that in John 21 when in the restoration of Peter, Jesus' restoration, he says, Peter, feed my sheep. And, John was, uh, and Jesus was preparing Peter for this place of leadership and he steps into uh, that space here in verse 15. What a difference that 40 days had made in the life of Peter. What a difference the resurrection had made. What a difference forgiveness and restoration had made. And the disciples needed to address this issue of Judas's betrayal and his death and a replacement for him. And while it could be perceived that this is a problem, Peter indicated confidently and, and clearly that the Old Testament foretold these actions and then gave instructions on how to uh, find his Judas's replacement. And I think that there's um, some great lessons out of here uh, that we can learn from these few verses here. Peter identifies two really important aspects relating to the Scriptures because he's, he stands up and he says the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke. And those two aspects there were his confidence, his confidence uh, in the scriptures and the prophetic nature of the Old Testament. The scripture had to be filled. I think this is part of the connecting of the dots that Jesus had done in those 40 days. We are now, Jesus is now gone. This group is on their own. They're now about to step into a whole new space prior to the Holy Spirit obviously coming, but they are now on their own. And where do they turn to? Where, where does Peter direct them? He directs them to the scriptures. And secondly, the, 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 the Old Testament came from the Holy Spirit. Peter would affirm that in 2 Peter, 2 Peter 1.21 when he says uh, that prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but with prophets through, hu uh, though human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So his confidence was there in the scriptures and their source was the Holy Spirit. And I think it's really, that's a, a, a key point to uh, note there. In fact, I'm going to call that one principle uh, number two for us to pay attention to. The church is built on God's word guided by the Holy Spirit. The church in Acts chapter 1 that's unfolding there to this church here at Mueller Community Church is built on God's word and guided by the Holy Spirit. When scripture, when scripture speaks, God speaks. And that hasn't changed. But what happened to Judas? Luke quite graphically goes through uh, what happened uh, to, uh, to Judas. 
uh, with the payment that he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, he fell headlong, the body burst open, his intestines spilled out, and everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is the field of blood. Quite graphic, it's vivid, it's horrifying. I don't wish to park uh, there today, but I think there's some things we can just draw from it. You know, Judas, Judas journeyed with Christ for three years. Part of that inner circle, what an incredible opportunity was offered to him. Judas heard the Sermon on the Mount. He would wrestle, uh, he would wrestle over uh, the understanding, the parables. He witnessed Jesus' miracles. He shared in the ministry experiences, even the group treasurer. And... Uh, but, it, but he betrayed the Lord. And I think there, there, there's, a, there's a word of caution and caring, uh, a word of caution that sits out there uh, for all of us. He threw it away. His di- life and death need to cause sobering reflection about those who can journey all the way along and, uh, and, then, and then betray Christ. But I think it's interesting, though, that uh, Peter then he stands up, he says, Peter... Uh, and he refers to these two Psalms, Psalm 69, and you'll see that at the bottom of some of your versions of the Bible, it'll have that Bible reference, and Psalm 109, and uh, in terms of the replacement for him, for Judas. And Peter says, it's written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of his leadership. Here's Peter coming back to the scriptures to help uh, in uh, not only just identifying the problem, but working towards a resolution of, of filling in Judas's position. Verse 21, though, we have a couple of criteria here for the apostles in terms of uh, the selection. And uh, therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who had been with us the whole time. Uh, the Lord Jesus was living amongst us and beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taking up from, taken up from us for one of these must be a witness of the resurrection. So there's the two criteria. Been with us the whole time, a witness to the resurrection. That's why we believe that the apostles were for this time and for this place only. Why the 12? Why the replacement? I think it sits in part of Acts and its transition that it was. The early church was obviously going to originate here in Jerusalem and the apostles had a special role to Israel both now and again sometime uh, in the future. So they come, they nominate two men, uh, Joseph and Matthias and then it says, there it is, prayer number two. They prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you've chosen. Uh, to take over his apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs and they cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias so he is added to the 11 apostles. Here they are. Jesus has ascended to heaven. They're now in this first space standing in to resolve this problem as it were and what did they do? In dependence of God they prayed. In dependence of God they prayed. There's prayer number two. And they acknowledged that God knew everything. Look what they said, you know everyone's heart. I think there's an acknowledgement there of their own limitations into this process. And uh, the God was in control. They'd, they'd come up with uh, the two candidates that they felt was, uh, were appropriate and so on. And then it says, uh, which it surprises some people, but they cast lots and then in, entrusted the outcome of that into God's leading. And I think this is another issue. This is the last time that casting lots is mentioned. It does seem to sit in the Old Testament there. Chapter 2, we're going to find with the coming of the Holy Spirit, I think the way God leads and guides was going to change uh, significantly. And I think finally the, uh, the third principle to come out of there. The church is built by God using imperfect people. They acknowledge that. Lord, you know everyone's heart that's here. God uses imperfect people, but he uses imperfect people who pray. Wiersbe says of this chapter that it was not the time for asking who was the greatest. They had done that when it was recorded. Or who committed the greatest sin. It was a time for this group to be praying together and standing together. The gospel was about to be unleashed on the world. And these disciples were about to be filled with the Holy Spirit and become witnesses that would eventually make its way all the way to Rome. Three principles, let me revise though. We'll go back to the PowerPoint. Thanks, Bev, there. 
The church is not built on programs, but God's power through the Holy Spirit. The church is built on God's word, guided by the Holy Spirit. And the church is built by God using imperfect people who pray. There's some principles out there, but where do we move those principles then to priorities? Well, here's two priorities that I believe are ours and are ours today. As God's people in this local church, we must be people of the book. And secondly, we must be people of prayer. And how do we do that in the 21st century? How do we do that with all the distractions that sit around about us? How do we do it when we, when it comes to biblical resources, that in our Western culture, we have access to so much biblical resource, but why aren't we engaging with it? There's a challenge for us, for the church, particularly in the West, but those priorities are still sitting out there for all of us. As God's people in this local church, we must be people of the book. And part of the calling, I believe, on my life is to help people engage with the book. If there are barriers to that, if there are educational barriers, if there's other barriers to it, uh, then I will walk and work with people and, uh, uh, to help them achieve that. But sometimes the barrier sits on the other side and we just don't want to engage with it. We don't read it. We don't discipline ourselves to be able to engage with it. And secondly, we need to be people of prayer. Why? Because it's a spiritual battle that we're involved in. We need to be in a place where we're dependent on God. And that's why just working with not just programs for programs sake, but looking for opportunities for this church to be able to pray and for you to be able to engage. We need to be praying for Myanmar because there's a battle that's going on there. We need to be praying for what's happening in this place. We need to be praying for our school because it's a target. Uh, it's a target, it really is. But if we as a church in dependence on our own abilities and resources, driven by our own agendas and opinions, and living in the present for ourselves, we'll become like the church of Ephesus, who lost their first love and the lamp of their testimony was to be removed. So as we go forward in dependence on God, guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit, anticipating Jesus' return, we'll continue to be a light on a hill to the world that needs Christ. Let me pray. Lord, we come before you this morning, having started our journey through Acts here and the incredible revelation that's been recorded for us to be able to, to see what you are doing in that time and in this space. And Lord, as your church, it's about your power. It's about your Holy Spirit. This is your church. And Lord, we want this our local church to be continued to be guided by your word and the Holy Spirit as you use each of us, imperfect people in many ways. But Lord, we want to be a people who pray in dependence on you, guided by the Holy Spirit, anticipating your return and uh, as we continue to serve you in this capacity. And we honour and we bless you for the exalted Lord Jesus that you are, dead, buried, resurrected and ascended on a high. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.